Love. Above all things, I believe in love. Love is like oxygen. It may be true that all you need is love, but the romance addict takes this a little too literally. The boy, Tom Hansen of Margate, New Jersey, grew up believing that he'd never truly be happy until the day he met the one. They put finding the perfect relationship above all else, and they feel like real life can't start until they meet with the one. I've been dating since I was 15. I'm exhausted. Where is he? Here's how you spot this relationship-hungry character on screen. At their core, the romance addict is in love with love. I deserve to be with somebody who loves love! Their grandiose ideas about romance probably come from fictions rather than actual experiences. We need like a moment, right? A moment like where the prince and the princess pledge their trough. And like us, they might have watched a few too many rom-coms. Met in an elevator? My hair came undone? Are you kidding me? I'm basically Sandra Bullock. And then it happened. Did the elevator just stop? But this hopeless romantic's high expectations for a fairy tale ending can make them easily disappointed by real life relationships or hopelessly picky about potential partners. One minute he's too thirsty, the next minute he's too distant. You're impossible to please. Even more than they love love, the romance addict hates being single. I'm done being single. I'm not good at it. Any time spent out of relationships feels like a failure, and they approach the hunt for the one with a type A professionalism that takes the romance and the fun out of dating. It encourages professional women to approach finding a mate with the same kind of dedication and organization that they bring to their careers. Although they may spout optimistic rhetoric about love in general, But it can happen. People do live happily ever after. They're likely to feel fatalistic about their own love lives and catastrophize their romantic disappointment. I'd finally die fat and alone and be found three weeks later half-eaten by Alsatians. The weird thing about the relationship addict is that they're often a real catch, but they're so obsessed with finding the perfect guy or gal that they often make themselves unlucky in love. Have you noticed, Molly, the common denominator in all your can't-find-a-man is you? Here's our take on three habits that the relationship addict uses to self-sabotage, and how more nuanced versions of the trope reveal that buying into the empty promises of on-screen romance can doom your search for the real thing. Hi everyone! Exciting news, today we have a new episode of Take Two airing on Netflix Film Club YouTube channel. Today's big question, who's the ideal guy of our times, according to modern rom-coms? Is it the secretly sensitive, cool guy? Or is it the secretly awesome dork? Check it out on the Netflix Film Club YouTube channel. I'm gonna meet the perfect guy and I'm gonna get married. The first way that a romance addict can sabotage their chances for love is by scripting their relationships. I'm gonna get married at 26, have my first baby at 28, a boy, Christopher. Named after Christopher Robin from Winnie the Pooh? No, named after Christopher... The romance addict's behavior may stem from a dreamy, sentimental place, but their actual dating life might be characterized by a neurotic drive to plan the future. Ross, you have planned out the next 20 years of our lives. We've been dating for six weeks. The productive, perfectionist version of the romance addict tries to ensure their picture-perfect ending arrives in a certain way by a certain time, as if writing themselves into a rom-com. Though, to anyone else, the specifics might seem more high-maintenance than enchanting. Well, it's not like I have a list. Oh, yes, you Attractive, do. Attractive, college-educated. She wants two kids, a boy and a girl. It's not hard. I know at I'm least... I'm not done. It's true that there can be benefits to the kinds of life goals they set. Research shows that married people have social, legal, and economic advantages over single people, an inequity called singleism. Think about it. If you are single, after graduation, there isn't one occasion where people celebrate you. But scripters view reaching romantic milestones as a necessity. I feel like he was just checking off his boxes. Get into a relationship. Check. Hmm. What? It sounds kind of like you. Most of their scripts align closely with social norms, placing value on conventional aspirations like marriage and children. At last, life is on track. Bridget Jones, fiancé, wife, mother. 
And while these traditional goals can be meaningful for many, of course, often scripters haven't done enough introspection to differentiate between what they really want and what they assume they should want because it offers external validation. Charlotte treated marriage like a sorority she was desperately hoping to pledge. Scripting love isn't usually very fulfilling or very successful. Often, the relationship addict's dating history is kind of abysmal. Whereas we all know that serial monogamist who's always in a long-term relationship, even if it's not the most passionate affair, the choosy, volatile relationship addict might rarely be in a long-term relationship or take a while to settle down. Stop watching these stupid dating shows to get in the game, June. Go out and meet somebody. We have very tough criteria. Still, many consider themselves experts on love. The Olive Theory is based on my friends Marshall and Lily. He hates Olive, she loves them. And in a weird way, that's what makes them such a great couple. By giving out unsolicited relationship advice to others, they attempt to affirm their precarious romantic ideas, even while deep down they're plagued by doubts. I, I want to believe, but nothing is happening. and. I just don't think it's working. Underlying everything the romance addict does is a panic. As if they believe both that marriage and family are the only things that matter in life, and that for some reason, they won't be able to get those things, whether it's because they're unworthy, unlucky, or just doing it wrong. But why does she deserve to get married and I don't? What's sad about this is that out of anxiety that they may never get what they most want, the insecure romance addict tries to fast forward through the actual romance romance part, just to be sure that they get the happily ever after. I have found the future Mrs. Ted Mosby. Often, this character is talented or successful at their career, where it can be useful to be an expert planner with initiative, but they're unlikely to fully appreciate their achievement at work because they haven't placed the same importance on this as a milestone. Charlotte in Sex and the City stops working after she thinks she's found her ideal husband, and is a little taken aback by the long line of others who would kill for her amazing job. It seemed every aspiring gallerina in New York wanted Charlotte's job. When the romance addict brings their professional enterprise and organizational zeal to love, though, how to apply successful business strategies to finding a husband. This doesn't work. The script is designed to eliminate the risk in love, but it can also destroy the spontaneity. Passion and chemistry are replaced by a laundry list of traits that just look good on paper. But I thought you were feeling Jared. I am, but girl, these lead have been vetted. And Jared didn't even go to college. Above all, this character seeks control. I have decided that this is the year I'm getting married. Charlotte, that's wonderful! Who's the lucky guy? Well, I don't know yet. Recognizing that love is, to a large degree, mysterious and out of our control, not a recipe you can replicate with the right ingredients, can be devastating to the relationship addict. In the worst cases, they even turn to obsessive or violent behaviors to cope. She left notes on my car. She threw trash on my lawn. She left voicemails yelling about how I wasn't helping enough with the dog. I don't even have a dog. But impossible standards are a mindset you can work through. Like we see in Insecure's Molly Carter. You act like fine when it's supposed to be some sort of fairy tale, but it's not. In therapy, Molly learns about another scripting habit called magical thinking, which revolves around her need for control. When we believe what we want can influence the external world, as opposed to accepting things as they are. Rather than continuing to orient her goals around what she's supposed to do or what her life should be, you frame a lot of things in your life with should. Molly has to develop a more open-ended mindset so that she can start valuing the achievements and relationships she's been discounting as not enough. If your shoulds didn't come to fruition, would you be open to your life looking a different way? Later on, when she finds herself insisting on fixing a romantic relationship that's no longer working, We gotta go to therapy. I'll be more open. I'll share more. She's forced to honestly ask herself why and whether this is what she really wants. I, I can be better. I mean, What are you fighting for right now? Is this what you really want, Molly? Sooner or later, the romance addict has to accept that some things will always be outside of their control. When scripters finally grasp that love doesn't go according to plan, they usually do get happy endings, which just may look a little different than they expected. I don't care if you ever marry me. I just want to be with you. With her tendency to romanticize, it pushed her towards a certain worldview. 
Rosie, if you will. The second way that a romance addict can manifest or sabotage themselves is with the quintessential romantics problem, idealizing love. They, they dance together at a ball, or they kiss in a tower, or they sail on a magic carpet through the sky. I just want to look into Greg's eyes and, you know, have a moment. The dreamy romance addict can be deeply sweet. Obsessing over romance makes them a master of the adorable hallmarks of on-screen romance dramatic professions of love, grand gestures, and constant devotion. But they spend a lot of time in their imagination, dreaming up elaborate fantasies in their heads, which might be based only on a couple of actual interactions. I ran into Josh, he made me feel warm inside, like glitter was exploding inside me, then I moved here. This can mean they're not on the same page as partners they don't even know that well. It's a great look. But you're looking at the wrong girl. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. There's a word for this compulsive longing for your feelings to be reciprocated by someone who may be more of an idea than a reality to you. Limerence. What if this man is my destiny and I never meet him? And it often feels like romantic stories can encourage these one-sided, unreal infatuations without offering much in the way of guiding us through the messy, mundane parts of maintaining a relationship. Through the romance addict character, who's often a fan of rom-coms, fairy tales, or other grand romances, more recent narratives offer us a meta-critique of the way that narratives can shape or distort our expectations of love. So the moment you're craving isn't anchored in real emotion. It's a script dictated to you by our society's patriarchal love narrative. We see them compare their lives to romantic comedies and tragic love stories, using pieces of culture to build up their own personal mythos of romance. The dreamer romance addict fixates on what life could be if only they had their fairy tale romance. I want John Cusack holding a boombox outside my window. I want to ride off on a lawnmower with Patrick Dempsey. They view love as all or nothing, which can make them brave in love and capable of experiencing romantic heights. I don't want to love in half measures. I want it all. But when life doesn't quite live up to the picture they created in their head, it just feels unfair to them. Molly bases a lot of her romantic aspirations on her parents' union, which she believes is ideal. So she's shattered when she learns that her parents' marriage overcame an affair. Here I am trying to find a like my dad, thinking that my parents' marriage is the thing. All the while, they're this too. The romance addict's lovesickness or love bombing techniques can also be off putting for partners who value reality or a down to earth perspective. But a life without love, that's terrible. No, being on the street, that's terrible. Sometimes more dramatic portrayals of romance addicts demonstrate how the compulsion to seek out love can be seriously intense or destructive. Netflix's Love deals with love and sex addictions in a clinical sense through the character of Mickey Dobbs. Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. It's more about learning how to not pig out on sex and love and relationships. Being addicted to romantic validation and dysfunction is just as damaging for Mickey as her drug and alcohol addictions. Hoping and waiting and wishing and wanting love. Hoping, hoping for love has ruined my life. Science agrees. The feeling of love gives us a hit of positive hormones similar to what we get from other addictive substances. I miss that feeling. When we were together doing all that stuff, I felt really connected to somebody. It felt good. Crazy ex-girlfriend frames Rebecca Bunch's romance-addicted traits as funny at first, but later reveals them to be symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Profound fear of abandonment instability in relationships, unstable sense of identity. As Rebecca learns to thrive with a disorder that heightens the influence that emotional attachments have on her, she shows us how hard life can really be for relationship addicts. She's dealing with extremes of how much power, love, idealizing, and isolation can have over us. I know what I'm capable of when I feel abandoned. And it's a place where I can hurt myself. Extreme romantic Lorna on Orange is the New Black even appears to suffer from erotomania, the delusion that someone is in love with you despite evidence that they're not. I don't know this woman, okay? We went on one date. One. She's a stalker. For all its dangers, love is important. But you can't live your life without intimacy. 
You need and deserve love. But the key for most dreamers is understanding that relationships are a two-way street. They have to love a flawed person instead of an idea. With any luck, they'll find that love in reality is much richer than the version they spent so much time imagining. And he makes me laugh. And, and I feel like I can be myself around him. The third way that a relationship addict might self-sabotage is by collecting relationships. The one is that ever-elusive needle in the haystack, so finding them might seem like something of a numbers game. If they fall in love often enough, a relationship addict will have to find their soulmate eventually, right? It's like, okay, I'm ready. Where is she? First, they jump into new relationships easily. Their eagerness for this to be the right thing right now leads them to ignore obvious flaws or red flags. He could really be the one. Charlotte, honey, you've only known him for two weeks. You, you can know his email address. You cannot know he's the one. They'll take the smallest signs of compatibility to mean it's a love written in the stars. Just because some cute girl likes the same bizarro crap you do? That doesn't make her your soulmate, Dom. Or have even idealized love so much that they can picture their future with just about anyone. I've been carrying that ring around in my wallet for six years. Because you don't know when you're going to meet the right girl, and the moment's going to be right. But pretty soon, the collector promptly invents reasons to end their relationships. Counterintuitively, they can be quite shallow. If I'm going to marry someone, she has to be perfect only interested in someone who fits a very specific profile and dumping partners for the most trivial of reasons. Charlotte broke it off then and there. It would never work. He was American classic, she was French country. The pattern reveals that the collector suffers from a surprising fear of commitment. The thought of choosing wrong is more daunting to them than putting the choice off forever. You know what's scarier than being alone? You know what's worse? Being alone with the wrong guy for the rest of your life. Love at first sight has long been considered romantic, but it also leaves plenty of room for the hero to show just how fickle his affection can be. Switching between romantic fixation so quickly signals that on some level they see their romantic interests as interchangeable. More than they want one specific person, they want a relationship. I don't want to be single, okay? I just, I just, I just want to be married again. Getting bored and always searching for the next person is textbook for these collectors or serial daters, according to the New York Times. As clinical psychologist Dr. Chloe Carmichael explains, most of them don't realize what they're doing. They might sincerely believe that they haven't met the right person and be unaware that they have a fear of intimacy. I realize why I'm still single. I'm picky. I'm not going to settle. For many of these characters, relationship collecting is a form of denial. It allows them to avoid some essential truth about who they really are or what they really want, which might diverge from the fairy tale. By his own account, Ted Mosby on How I Met Your Mother wants nothing more than to get married. Nothing hotter than a guy planning out his own imaginary wedding, huh? But for most of the show, dating around is a distraction from the deeper truth. That he's not really looking for a wife, he's just biding his time until Robin wants him back. There's no top five, Robin. There's just a top one, and it's you. Charlotte and others, too, only find peace when they realize they love someone who's not the ideal type they've been searching for. Harry's not who I expected to fall in love with, but I did. Which ultimately suggests maybe they're not the person they thought they were. But maybe that's a good thing. In the end, it's up to the collector to face facts about their behavior instead of hiding it behind a constant rotation of love interests. And I'm a sex and love addict, and I... I think I need to just be by myself for maybe like a year and try and figure this shit out. The romance addict can develop a healthier outlook through better boundaries and less catastrophizing. And usually they discover that whatever they were afraid of wasn't as bad as it seemed. You're gonna end up all alone and with no mans. Well, maybe I am. And would that be the worst thing that could happen? The romance addict may have a lot of wrong thinking to overcome, but they also have the most important thing right, that love is worth it. My good friend Charlotte, the eternal optimist, 
who always believes in love. We can admire their perseverance, their sensitivity of feeling, the ferocity of their passion. The point is usually just that their image of love needs some serious updating. This also means loving your friends, family, your job, your community, and most of all, yourself. Love is vital for us all, but it's up to the romance addict to realize that includes much more of their lives than they think. Maybe it's not that you don't have love in your life. Maybe it's that you don't recognize it when it's there. This is The Take. What do you want our take on next?